questions time. Your questions, my answers. Go to any video on my channel, put in any questions you want about space and astronomy. I'll find them, answer them here. Here we go. The Guardian wants to know, what happens to a black hole when there's no more matter around it? Most of the time, most black holes have no matter around them. They've consumed all the matter nearby. So they're just there. Now there's still going to be energy from the background of the universe falling into them. There's going to be particles, uh, of, you know, high energy particles falling into them, but they're just going to go straight in. The rest of the time there's going to be nothing around them. It's only when they've got too much material to consume all in one bite that you get the, the accretion disk building up and that's when the things actually are hot. That's sort of the scary thing about black holes. There could be a black hole moving towards our solar system and we wouldn't even see it because it's not consuming any material. So most of the time, they're just there. Gonzalo Zarco. Hey Fraser, I have a question. Let's say an asteroid the size of the one that killed the dinosaurs or even bigger is going to hit the Earth. Could humanity build a bunker deep and strong enough to survive the impact? Thank you. The risk, the problem with a gigantic asteroid striking the Earth, I mean, well, there's all kinds of them, right? But if you're in the impact zone, the place that carves out kilometers deep of rock, no, we can't build a bunker. But if you're on the opposite side of the Earth, then you're just going to be on the planet when that asteroid strike happens. The big danger from these really big asteroids is the material that rains back down onto the Earth. So the asteroid hits and then it kicks up all of this debris and then the debris goes supersonic and then comes back down at other parts of the Earth. In many cases it's superheated and literally lights all of the material, all the plant material on fire. It increases, it superheats the atmosphere. So in theory if you could dig down, get you know, dig deep into the rock, have a place that's safe away from the atmosphere of the Earth, you could theoretically be safe. Now the question is how long could you last? It might take hundreds, maybe thousands of years for the atmosphere to cool back down. So it might be that you just can't last. Uh, this was handled in the book Seven Eves, which is just great. And you should definitely uh, give that a read if you're interested in this idea, because they actually do that. Alrighty then, 214. Fraser, everyone talks about the microbes that might infect Mars, but doesn't this microbe also have to survive the freezing irradiated vacuum of space for the length of the journey first? Isn't that, you know, asking a lot from the little buggers? Or is this so achievable that it's simply skipped over as a given? The latter. When the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, one of their jobs was to bring back the camera system of the Lunar Prospector mission. So they brought back this camera system, brought it back to Earth, and realized that there were Earth microbes that had been out on the surface of the moon for years, just in the radiation, no atmosphere, no pressure, no water, nothing, and they were fine. They brought them back, brought them back to life, and they did fine. So no, if our spacecraft go to Mars, they are absolutely, some of them are gonna survive that journey. You know, tardigrades, water bears, they can handle this kind of thing. So there's a lot of Earth life that can handle the cold vacuum of space for long periods of time, land in a place that's nice and safe and warm and wet, and just get rolling again. So this is why it's such a concern. Kent Linkletter. On the answer about whether we can reach things we can see, you said that the universe would expand faster than we can move, even if we could travel at the speed of light. However, as we get further and further away from the Earth, will we also not start to move with the expanding universe and eventually find ourselves moving away from Earth and be unable to even return home, ever? Exactly. If we get far enough away from Earth, if we get to some other galaxy that is billions of light years away from Earth, and over time, the space between these galaxies is expanding, it's increasing pretty fast, and dark energy is kicking in and it's accelerating things even more, then you can imagine where you could fly out to some galaxy, then you could turn around and try to get home, and now the space is expanding faster than you can even return. But we've got to be billions of light years away. You've got to go to whole other galaxies, which is almost impossible anyway. So I think you don't really have to worry about that. You add you one. Hello, Fraser, and happy 2017. I have a question on you. If energy and mass are two different manifestations of the same thing, does energy curve space? Energy and mass are interchangeable in the words of, of Einstein, right? E equals mc squared. So if you could collect together, let's say an Earth's worth or a Sun's worth of 
instead of mass, and the sun is made of mass, it's made of hydrogen, if you could collect it together, but it was energy, like photons of energy compressed down into this area, it would act the same way. It would twist, it would bend space-time, and material would orbit around it. Now the problem is I don't know how you can get energy that compact together without it wanting to escape, uh, but this is absolutely energy mass. And so if you have a black hole, and that's something that's going to keep all that material together, the black hole could be made of mass, it could be made, or it could be made of matter, it could be made of energy, all in the same same thing and it doesn't matter it's just distorts space-time things will orbit it and this is why you can't even really say that a black hole is made of mass of matter or antimatter or energy it's just black hole the only black hole basket of puppies the universe expanding and if you had a spaceship that could catch up and pass the universe where would you be so if I understand the question right you are in your spacecraft and you fly out and the universe is expanding and you pass the expansion of the universe and you look back and there's this expanding spheres bubble of universe, right? This is sort of what your mind is imagining, right? All right, well, two options. Option number one, the universe is infinite. So the question doesn't make sense. You could go on as far as you wanted, as fast as you wanted, and you would never get away from this expanding universe, right? The second possibility is that the universe is finite. But you can't sort of think of a finite universe as a sphere. A better way to think about it, an expanding universe, a finite universe, is a game of asteroids. So imagine that you go to the top of the screen in a game of asteroids, you're gonna appear on the bottom. If the screen gets bigger, it means you're gonna travel further, but you're still gonna pop up on the bottom. You're gonna go to the right, you're gonna come out on the left. And imagine it's a 3D version of asteroids, you're gonna go towards the front, and you're gonna come out the back. Now that sounds super weird, right? Like why, how can you, are you teleporting? But, and, but remember, you know, best, the best analogy to do is to imagine a, a globe, a sphere, right? And you can move around, go in one direction on the earth and you'll return to your starting point. That is a finite surface area. And yet you can move infinitely around on that finite surface area. So when you're trying to think about the universe, you just have to scale it up one more dimension. So you've got a 3D universe embedded in like a 4D space. Now we've done a whole episode just on this. Uh, so it gives into, goes into way more detail, but that's kind of the short version. So the, so the answer is, in neither case, can you get away from the universe? Zap fan, zap fan. What would be the nearest term, most straightforward method of sending a probe like New Horizons to Planet Nine within a career lifetime, like 30 years? Going to Planet Nine is gonna to be tough. It is far, like really far. Like Pluto is in our neighborhood compared to where Planet Nine is gonna be. So you're gonna need something that can, that can either achieve a tremendous amount of velocity or you're gonna to need to be patient. The best solution that's in the works right now is this idea of the Breakthrough Starshot, this solar sail powered micro probe that is powered by some kind of laser. You zap the probe, the solar sail, you accelerate it to a tremendous velocity. It makes, it crosses that distance and does a really quick flyby. In fact, I think that if we do discover Planet Nine or other objects in this sort of more distant solar system, these will be great testing grounds for this idea of the breakthrough star shot. Why go to the nearest star, which is light years away, when you can start with the relatively close Planet Nine or things like that? So that's my hope, is that Breakthrough Starshot will test out their techniques on some of these closer objects. Anne Boleyn, how do you feel the current political climate will affect our tremendous progress made in the past few years in our space program? Do you feel we'll still be able to stay on point for Mars for 2030 or sooner and accomplish Europa? I'm not sure most people would agree that we have achieved a tremendous amount in human space exploration in the last little while. We went to the moon in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, we've had some space stations. We've got the International Space Station, the Space Shuttle, but a lot of it is just orbiting around and around the Earth. We didn't push out beyond the orbit of, of the Earth. We haven't gone back to the moon. So I think if you ask most space exploration enthusiasts, they'd say that, that human space exploration has kind of stalled. Now there's lots of people making promises in the future. We're gonna go to asteroids. We're gonna return to the moon. We're gonna put humans on Mars. But very few people are actually putting 
those words into action in developing a reasonable plan, long-term plan. And the problem is that the political system in the United States overturns, you get a different political group, they throw out the plans of the previous organization and you get a new one. And the problem is that to colonize or to, to send human explorers to an asteroid or to Mars takes a long-term commitment. It's got to span multiple um, presidencies, multiple generations of political parties. So I think that, that human exploration is kind of stalled. Now the bright hope in this is that you've got some of the private agencies like SpaceX planning to send humans privately to Mars. But once again, these are all just promises. These are all just words. So we need to see actions. We need to see people actually take those steps. I think that for the next probably few decades, we're going to see more of just this back and forth where, where one party comes in and has some plan for, for human space exploration and then the next party comes in and they cancel those plans, they come up with their plans and you kind of get what we got, which is you just keep going around and around and around the earth. That's, that's where I think we're at, unfortunately. Celia Lawler. What is Fraser Kane's relationship to Hubble? I, 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 I love Hubble. What's, what's our relationship? I don't know. It's a, you know, it's a robotic satellite that's up in space. Um, I don't work for Hubble, uh, but I do have a bunch of friends who, who do work with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and uh, probably the best example is Tony Darnell. He does the Deep Astronomy uh, YouTube channel here. You should check him out and listen to their regular shows. They often present new stuff from the Hubble Space Telescope. So that's about as close relationship I have with the Hubble Space Telescope. Louise C. Question. Do we have an idea of the rough shape of our universe? And do we have any theory at all about what might come after the edge of the universe? Do time and space just stop? Is that even possible? Is nothing possible? We kind of covered this question earlier on in this episode. So I'm not going to, again, if the universe is infinite, then it goes on to infinite. There's no way outside of it. And if the universe is finite, then imagine something like a three-dimensional game of asteroids where wherever you go, you return to your starting point, right? But the question is, what is the shape? And the interesting thing about the universe is that we know that the shape of the universe is flat or very close to flat. Now, what does flat mean? Flat means that if you take two parallel lines, two laser beams, and you shoot them off into space, they will be side by side forever. They won't get further away, they won't get closer together. And that's really interesting because if you look at the, the, like the sphere of the Earth, for example, and you shoot off two, two straight lines, two laser beams two, on, on Earth, the beams are going to, uh, they're going to come apart and they're going to come back in together. As you, you know, imagine like, a, like a, a chunk of an orange, you put a quarter of an orange and you get this shape along the sides of it. So that is what a sphere would look like. So we can tell just by, by measuring the geometry of the universe that we know that it's not spherical. But then there are shapes that can have these parallel lines, this flatness, and yet still exist. I'll give you an example. A donut, right? So if you take a donut and you put two parallel lines on a donut, you can imagine you go around the sort of the top of the donut and they remain parallel. They go around the side of the donut and they remain parallel. In any direction that you send two parallel lines on a donut, they will remain parallel. So what it means is the universe could be the shape of a donut, a torus. Uh, another shape is like a dodecahedron, like you know, like a 20-sided die if you play D&D. Uh, again, two parallel lines will move along and then they'll go over an edge and then they'll go along and they'll go over another edge and they'll remain parallel or a cube. So there's lots of shapes, there's, there's a bunch more, there's lots of shapes you can have that allow for uh, a universe where, where it will be flat, where the surfaces will be flat, where parallel lines will remain parallel forever and yet still be a finite universe. And this is still one of those big unsolved questions in physics. Is the universe infinite or is the universe finite with some kind of flat topology, some kind of flat shape? And that's still an unsolved question in science. It's leaning towards infinite, but better records will tell us a better answer. Kurt Reber. Hey Fraser, thought of a question. What if it were possible for two Earths to simply be in contact with each other, no collision? Imagine it would be like two spherical magnets rolling against each other, or would it? Would they attract each other so much that they would slowly meld into a new sphere at a tectonic rate? I wonder if Kerbal Space Program could simulate this. I'd use Universe Sandbox to simulate this, and what you would get is you would get these two Earths side by side, and then they would heat up, and they would melt, 
and they would form one big sphere. And this is what's known as hydrostatic equilibrium. This is why all of the bodies in the solar system are spherical beyond a certain size. Literally, if you get to a certain size, you know, which is like, like a little smaller than, say, the moon, then that object is going to turn into a sphere. It's just because the force of the gravity pulling everything inward is stronger than any kind of force that we be pushing outward to stop them from, from merging into a larger sphere. So if you had your two balls right next to each other, hmm. If you had those two spheres right next to each other, they would form one larger sphere. And it would happen. I'm not sure how long it would take. It would take a while, but it would still happen. Uh, it would, it, you wouldn't want to live on it while it was happening. It would be very hot, very dangerous. Hello, 4022. What major objects in the solar system have we yet to send a probe to? Well, let's go the other way. Let's see what we've sent probes to. We've sent probes to Mercury, to Venus, to Earth, obviously, to the Moon. We've gone to Mars. We've gone to Jupiter, and we've done flybys of its various larger moons. We've got a probe at Saturn. We sent a flyby to Uranus and a flyby to Neptune, and obviously we sent a mission to Pluto. We've been to uh, Ceres, asteroid Ceres, and Vesta, and a bunch of comets, and a bunch of other asteroids. What have we not been to? Well, we haven't been to a bunch of asteroids. We haven't been properly to some of the outer planets, like to Uranus and Neptune. You know, one of the most interesting moons in the entire solar system is, is Triton, which is one of Neptune's moons. We haven't even taken a look at that very close, just one flyby from, from Voyager. So I think if, if I was to choose places to send spacecraft next, I would put a mission out to Uranus and Neptune, in addition to all the other stuff. And then it's a matter of coming back and looking at stuff more closely. We've only had one probe land on Titan briefly. We need to explore that world like crazy. We need to get down onto the surface of Europa. We need to get down to Ganymede and, and, and even try to see what it's like on Io. We want to come up with new plans for exploring the atmosphere and the surface of Venus. So we won't really only just begun proper exploration of the solar system. Okay, well, that's it. Another week, more questions. Thanks so much for everyone who asked them. As always, wherever you're watching the videos, just type in a question in the chat, in the comments at the bottom of the video. I'll find them and gather them together and answer them here. All right, we'll see you next week.